<laughs> I'm not here to um, make friends this morning. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, I, I, I'm going to sort of push the, push the edge a little bit because, you know, one of the definitions of coaching is about uh, getting people to think for themselves. Learning takes place on the edge. Um, when you're well within in, in your comfort zone, you're not necessarily learning much. Um, when you go too far over the comfort zone, you go in sort of panic and uh, the awareness goes down. And the other thing, of course, is that uh, you'll well know as a coach that, um, that all the answers are within yourself. So I'm not coming up with any answers here. What I'm, what I'm trying to do is to provoke the, the thinking, and I trust absolutely that the answers are all within you. Unless we change direction, we are liable to end up where we're headed, and I think you have your own ideas where we are headed depending on how much you, you have uh, sort of studied the current situation. There's another expression that I um, um, uh, heard recently, which uh, said, all we have to do to ensure the essentially extinction of all life on this planet is to do nothing. It's all we have to do. We live in a, a world that uh, we, you call it capitalism or call it consumerism, whichever you like, but um, it's, it's, it's dependent upon that. I mean, capitalism is based on consumerism. If you want to uh, grow the economy or whatever it is, you've got to sell stuff. I mean, George Bush said after 9-11, the best thing you can do to save America is buy more stuff. Not perhaps the cleverest thing to say just after 9-11, but that's what he said anyway. This was his solution. The idea of the economy shrinking, you know, we're in a recession. My God, this is terrible. Um, is it? <laughs> is it not the best possible thing that could happen is that we buy less stuff? Yeah? So what we have is an economic system that encourages us to buy more, pollute more, get more, and all that sort of stuff, and we have a situation on the planet itself that we have to reduce our consumption and our emissions by about 80% within the next 30 years. 80% reduction. So how can these two things fit together? The answer is they don't. It's as simple as that. They don't, and one of them has to change dramatically, really dramatically, one of them has to change. And guess what? It's capitalism that has to change. These two things are completely incompatible. What would you do differently in your role as a corporate leader, in your company, in your organization? What would you do differently about your family if this was true? And that provokes an amazing amount of thought for people. Humankind had always lived on its income, which is sort of the normal thing to do, isn't it? It makes sense to live on your income, not beyond your income. And so what essentially we had done um, for forever was to live on what we had, what we grew. First of all, what grew naturally, and then we learned a little bit about agriculture, and therefore we could grow a little bit more produce, and so we, we ate better, and so on and so forth. But we were very much dependent on what was available at the time in terms of, 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 of plants and, and, and animals that we used for food, and so on and so forth. Imagine if you were a family and you had lived on your income for many, many generations that lived on their income. And then one of the family suddenly decided, hey, you know that nest egg we've got for the family in case of a bad day? Let's raid the bank and take the nest egg out. And that nest egg was supplied by the sun. Millions and millions of years of the sun provided us with oil and coal. And that is stored in the bank. And we suddenly decided, let's raid the bank. 
And what happened when we raided the bank with the Industrial Revolution is everything went completely out of balance. Everything went crazy on the graphs. We had this extraordinarily idea growing out of that, that we could engineer in the early stages, we could engineer our way to utopia. And that led to cars and airplanes and, and so on and so forth. And now we're in that electronic, uh, sudden sort of technological advance again, rushing forward here. And the idea was, the idea has been ever since those days that our technology will take us to utopia. And that's how we've seen it. And this is madness. So we are grossly irresponsible and have been for 200 years in, in our production. We have not had the wisdom to say, if we are going to increase production, how do we use this in a responsible way? That has been forgotten. So what we have now is a huge amount of knowledge and a complete failure of wisdom in our society. Instead of 80% of the technology budget going into the military, which it does, to make weapons to kill people better, if that was used for our education, for supplying the needs of humanity for clean water and health care and all that sort of thing, we'd be in a completely different world. We have a fundamental crisis in the whole of our society globally that has to be addressed. And engaging ourselves in corporate social responsibility is a way of waking people up. But that ain't going to fix it. Since time immemorial, the structure of our societies, except, I would say, there's some indigenous societies which were much more, shall we say, egalitarian, but in our um, main societies in our world, as far as we know, the, 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 there has been a very much of a hierarchy, and whether it's been emperors or presidents or generals or uh, cardinals or popes or... In, in, all those, in all those sectors, it's been a hierarchical system. When you submit to a hierarchy, um, it, it's, it's quite a primitive state, shall we put it that way. Now, if we look at evolution, let me give you a very simple model of evolution, the simplest model, so sort of three-stage model. Uh, going from dependence, first of all, that's the lowest stage, dependence and then independence, and then interdependence, the three sort of stages of evolution. That takes place collectively as well as individually. So at, at a certain stage in our lives, we're dependent. We're dependent. We like to be told what to do, and our parents tell us what to do, and our school teachers tell us what to do, and all that sort of thing. And then we begin to break away from that dependence to rebel against that and, and seek our independence. And, and then... Finally, we mature beyond our independence, which is rather an unattractive stage in some ways. And then we mature beyond that and begin to uh, recognize the interconnectedness that we all have. Okay? So um, what has happened is, historically, humanity as a whole has been in this dependent state, very much dependent on the hierarchy. And increasingly, and particularly in recent uh, decades, we've been rebelling against that dependence, and various things are happening that are pretty obvious, and that is there is a decline in leadership. There's a decline in the respect for leadership. When I was young, um, um, you know, the, in, in, the, in the local town, um, the bank or the insurance company was a sort of pillar of society, and you, re you know, you respected them, and the, the head of the bank was, you know, head of the... Uh, oh, I don't know, the sort of debating society in the town, what do you call those different sort of social rotary club and things like that. You know, it was all very sort of honourable sort of stuff. You know, and now if you look at the surveys now, I mean about 80% respect in those days for these institutions. And now, um, what it, this, a recent survey I saw, uh, you know, respect, and this was before the crisis incidentally, now it, it's probably down about 1%, but before the crisis... Um, the respect for banks and, and financial institutions was down to 27% of society 
respected them. And that's down there with second-hand car salespeople, and, 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 um, and uh, it's actually slightly lower than, uh, than double glazing salesmen. Um, that is in decay. And it's being replaced, or should we say it needs to be replaced, by self-responsibility, but when you take the authority away, whether that authority was nasty or nice, whether it was a benevolent dictatorship or a, 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 a malevolent dictatorship, there was an order produced by that. Take that away so that either failing leadership or a failure of respect for that leadership, deserved failure of respect for that leadership, what happens at that point is that people are not accustomed to being self-responsible and therefore they go berserk for a bit. And that's what's going on. That's what's going on in our society. There's a breakdown of leadership and people are being irresponsible until they learn to be responsible. Because the only way you learn to be responsible is to have to be responsible. The primary product of coaching is building self-responsibility in the other person, isn't it? That's what you're doing. You're helping the other person to make their own choices. Choice making is how you get responsibility. You have to make your own choices. And the whole coaching industry, or I call it now a profession, has grown up to meet this urgent need for society to shift into proper responsibility. So, in a sense, coaches are the midwives of this birth of self-responsibility in society. And that's why it, the whole thing has grown up in the last 25 years. Because 25 years ago was, could be identified as a time where hierarchy began to break down. So the industry grows up to meet that need. This is the future. I mean, I'm deeply grateful for the existence of coaching as a profession. If we took self-responsibility for our health, the health care budget would be reduced by about 75% if people just accepted the fact that they are responsible for their own health. Our society is seriously ill because we do not take self-responsibility. How do we bring in education build self-responsibility into young people earlier instead of uh, dominating them. America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and Britain have higher levels of stress and distress, actually twice as high as the average of other countries. Mrs. Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, who had um, a love affair before the love affair between Blair and Bush, um, uh, but they had a love affair and they introduced what we call selfish capitalism. It's very much glorifying the individual, very much the success of the individual. You can succeed, you go for it as an individual. That was that extreme version of capitalism. So there was, in the short term, there was a gain by Thatcherism was good and everyone waved the flag and said, isn't it great, Thatcher's doing a wonderful job. Not exactly what I felt at the time, I have to say, but... Um, <laughs> But um, that's what happened. There was an economic benefit. And it was a social disaster because it takes far longer to extract ourselves from the damage that has been done by the glorification of the individual and the effects that that has consciously and subconsciously about people feeling inadequate because they can't measure up because they're not an individual success. It causes all these other spin-off things like childhood obesity, violence, teenage pregnancy, and all those sort of things that come out of that. And we've got to understand these bigger pictures. And one of the great tragedies of the social injustice that's going on is that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. The three richest men in the world are worth more than the poorest 600 million. Uh, worth more is not quite the right expression, I think. And one of the, one of the uh, uh, companies I know, a company called Target, which is a big uh, sort of chain store of uh, consumer rubbish that they have in America. Um, and uh, if you work for Target, um, you know, I should 
uh, <laughs> not mention it. Um, but the, the chief executive of, of Target, this was several years ago now, was making $73,000 a day, and the average staff pay in Target was $64 a day. And then we have the tobacco industry, of course, which is principal product is to kill people. I have no hesitation in saying it's all that. To me, it is evilness itself. And the difficulty is, I mean, that is, you know, two and a half times what, what, what um, Bin Laden killed in one day. And we had a war against terrorism, and we've been in trouble ever since. And yet, our leaders will sit and have dinner and give prizes to the executives of tobacco companies. This is madness. If we say, well, it's not very nice to be in the tobacco industry, or it doesn't suit my values, nothing changes. You know, we've got to call a spade a spade. And if it's uncomfortable, it's uncomfortable. And if you upset some people, you upset some people. That's the only way we're going to create change. I wrote an article about capitalism four years ago and was sort of castigated a little bit for it. And what's interesting now, I'm finding even business executives are sort of quietly coming in the coffee break and saying, gosh, you know, this whole system's breaking down and it's, it's, it doesn't do it. It's not right. Well, if only they'd talk to their colleagues and be able to speak out loud about it instead of trying to hide it, then we'd be getting somewhere. Adam Smith thought, who's the originator or has been ascribed to as the, the creator of, of um, capitalism said that, you know, once the cup is full, it will flow out and other people will get enough and so everyone will get taken care of. And it was a myth. You know, that is true if you're nice enough. But we ain't that nice. We haven't got there in evolutionary terms yet. Adam Smith may personally have been more evolved and said, well, that's what people in the top level, the interdependent, level are beginning to do. The trouble is we're not there yet. So that our system that was designed on that basis just simply doesn't work. So the pretense that capitalism works is, is, is based on a false premise in the first place. It just doesn't work. It's a rotten system. Ca communism was a rotten system and it failed. Capitalism is a rotten system and it failed. Let's be honest about it. What we have is an economy that people are in service to. You know, what happens is, you know, the banks, whatever it is, you know, they get into financial trouble. So what do they do? They lay off loads of people. You know, the top people in the bank still take home their, their, their millions and that sort of thing. But they lay off lots of people. In other words, that it's, it's the people is not the first consideration. The money is the first consideration. We have these coins and things, they're just part of an exchange system. That's the purpose of it, is to enable to, us to exchange goods and services. But the money has become the goal in itself. It's a complete distortion of trade. As coaches, we're sometimes working with companies and you want them to have a, a you know, fundamental change in their in their management culture, towards a, mo uh, a coaching culture, so we say, in an organization. So you go in and you do your stuff, and the culture changes by 10%. You feel, oh, well, you've had a bit of success. But actually, what happens is the company now settles down and says, oh, well, we've made our change. We don't have to do anything more. So you know, there is an, an argument that to say, either you change all the way, or I won't work with you. And if they don't want to change fundamentally about how they do everything, how they treat people, how they treat, treat their customers, all the things we're talking about, if they're not willing to do that, goodbye. Give me a call when you wake up. And just in relation to that, in absolute terms, you know, we've got all this stuff going on about the environment at the moment. In absolute terms, nothing has been, nothing has changed. You know, we're doing all this, you know, lots of things in the papers, all the newspapers like The Independent and everything, they've got green articles and green supplements, and we're doing this, and we're doing this, and the result is zero so far. When, when we're coaches, we're looking at whose agenda are we on. Now, what I'm saying is that there's a hierarchy of... Um, a hierarchy of 
shall we say, values. You know, I will be on the client's agenda, but if that client's agenda clashes with my values, do I continue on the client's agenda? And what I would say is that there's a hierarchy of values. And I'm just throwing this out there for you to think about as a coach. You know, at what point do you say what you're asking me to coach you on or to improve in your organization transgresses my values and I'm not going to support you going in that direction. Now, you can do that by asking other questions. Well, what if or what about or how does that affect your suppliers in Indonesia or whatever it is? There are ways of going there. But again, you need to be able to go outside the box and you need to have the knowledge to be able to ask those, those questions that are going to cause them to think that may bring, you, bring them up to the kind of values that you espouse and that you want. The boundary between them and us, and this is a, a way of explaining sort of ex consciousness expansion. And if we start here with the, um, the child when they're first born, they're only interested in themselves, and that's perfectly reasonable. I mean, they, if, they're, if they're uncomfortable or hungry or whatever it is, they scream until mum helps, yeah? And so their self-interest is there, and that's absolutely necessary for a young child. And as the person begins to grow up, they begin to include more in what they call us, and that would be their pop stars, their celebrities, their football teams, and that sort of thing become part of us, you know, or their village locally, or whatever it may be the sort of geographical content of what, can, what is us. And then outside that is them. And what we're really trying to do and what, what we have to do in this world is to keep people's consciousness, our own and other people's consciousness, expanding so that we begin to include more and more in us until we get out to everything there is, is us. So that's the very egocentric, um, small vision, shall we say. And then we get to the second one, the ethnocentric one, which is, shall we say, tribal. And that is often classified as sort of adolescent kind of way, kind of way of seeing things. And uh, if we're honest about it, much of our society is in this level. And I would say this is where, uh, you know, the whole capitalist system is ethnocentric. It's a tribal, my tribe is better than your tribe game. And so the, the whole economic system we have and the structural system we have actually keeps us in that tribal consciousness. And it, it, it has to go. It has to go. We will not survive if we stay in that tribal consciousness. I don't think anyone could have the title, deserves the title of a leader, until they have become world-centric in their consciousness. This is a question from Finland, from Tina Harmia. Sir John, while you've been working with organizations, have you noticed different value systems among new generations? For example, Generation Y or Generation MeWe? <laughs> um, uh, the, answer, the short answer is yes. And I work, at a lot of, uh, I work in a lot of different countries, and I see it in different countries. Um, I think that uh, there, there is a a younger generation that, that, that I have a lot of hope with. I think a lot of the, the younger people, and I think there are two stages of this, I think there are um, young 14-year-olds uh, who introduced their parents to the environment because their parents hadn't come across it before, but their children had at school or whatever it is, and that sort of thing. I've heard of a lot of people say, it was my children that first got me involved in the environment. But I think there's another stage of that, and that's the sort of 25 to 35-year-old people who I'm very impressed by. I'm very impressed by. We can read in the newspapers about, you know, wayward youth and that sort of thing, but I'm very impressed by those younger people. They often have very much higher values than the, 
than the heads of the corporations they work for and, and that sort of thing. And, and that creates a problem because you've got an inversion, in fact, in terms of values. The, the heads of the corporation are still buying their 4 by 4s and 400 horsepower to take their children a few hundred yards to school and that sort of thing. And the young people don't want that. So, John, do you really believe we have got time enough for a slow revolution through coaching? <laughs> uh, wonderful question. Thank you. Um, uh, the answer is yes and no, in, in my opinion. And that is why I say yes is that I think we do everything we possibly can because there's nothing better to do than to do everything you possibly can. And you get a lot of fulfillment out of doing everything you possibly can. Do I think that if all of us did everything we possibly can, at the present rate of progress, we are going to actually save the planet? Frankly, no. But we've got some help. We've got some help. And the help is the breakdown that we have just seen in the economic field. The increasing number, I don't know whether you've seen the statistics, but back in Fortune magazine in 2001, they gave statistics about the major events that were breakdown events that are occurring. It has gone up from about 40 a year from the beginning of the last century to 400 or more a year now. And these are everything from tsunamis to HIV to economic crises, earthquakes and everything. There's a whole lot of crises going on. That is a wake-up call. You can't deny the fact that these major events are taking place, and one of them has just taken place. And I believe a combination of all our efforts together, plus these inevitable events anyway, we, we will actually scrape through. I believe it. I prefer to be an optimist, because optimists have a better life anyway, I'm told. <laughs> so that's what I am.